the uh, challenge of speaking to you first group after lunch in a warm, packed room. Uh, I'm not sure how I'll do in keeping you awake, but at least I can take solace that dream visions are a legitimate form of revelation. So however you come out of here enlightened, it'll be okay. Um, one of the enduring legacies of the latter-day restoration of the gospel through Joseph Smith is additional scripture. Joseph Smith produced new volumes of scripture, as well as revised the Bible, the JST, and included additional accounts of biblical figures compiled in the Pearl of Great Price. The three biblical figures who received the most attention and amplification to their stories in these later texts were Enoch, Abraham, and Moses. The phen phenomenon of additional scriptural accounts has some parallels to the centuries before and after the coming of Jesus Christ. During this period, additional scriptural texts to what would later be determined the Jewish and Christian canons were found in the Septuagint, the Dead Sea Scrolls, early Christian literature, and a plethora of Jewish and Christian texts associated with <coughs> Old Testament figures classified under the modern term pseudepigrapha. Interestingly, three figures who received a lot of attention in these additional texts were Enoch, Abraham, and Moses. When one examines Joseph Smith's works on these figures, it is natural to wonder whether he was influenced by these earlier additional texts. In other words, how much did Joseph Smith have access to and read ancient texts such as fa are found in the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha? Are the accounts in the Pearl of Great Price simply retellings of these earlier ancient texts? Um, <clears throat> this paper will briefly address these questions as we discuss examples of Joseph Smith and his LDS contemporaries making reference to the Apocrypha and pseudo or Pseudepigrapha text. From this study, we should be able to see that although the pheno phenomenon of producing additional scriptures about Enoch, Abraham, and Moses is shared between Joseph Smith and his ancient counterparts, the influence of the earlier text on Joseph Smith is minimal, and thus Joseph Smith was independently revealing additional stories about these biblical figures. Yet, the few references to these texts in early church writings show great interest in them and an affinity to the eschatological prophecies found therein with the saints' current situation. Now, to make sure we're on the same page in discussing this topic, I'd like to review what I mean by a few of the key terms I'll be using. The Apocrypha, as opposed to the broader category of apocryphal texts, which uh, Tom Wayman will be talking more about later, is basically a closed list of books with a little variance between different uh, Christian denominations. When the Hebrew Bible was translated in, into Greek, the resulting manuscript came to be known as the Septuagint. The Apocrypha basically consists of the additional books found in the Septuagint, but not in the original Hebrew Bible. Even though the Jews produced the texts found in the Apocrypha, in the end they excluded them from their canon in the first centuries AD and following. Many early Christians accepted these texts in their canon, although with a lot of debate about their authority. Some Christians included the text from the Apocrypha interspersed among the other Old Testament books, while others combined them in one section, usually at the end of the Old Testament. The Pseudepigrapha is a collection of texts dating from around 200 BC to 200 AD that primarily make expansions on biblical figures. The Greek term Pseudepigrapha literally means falsely ascribed refers to the fact that these stories were most likely written by later authors using the name of earlier figures, not in an effort to create a hoax or, a liter or as a literary forgery, but to put forth teachings under the authority of the earlier, more well-known figure. Some stories that these texts include may have been actual oral or written accounts of biblical figures that were passed down until found in these later texts, but they never became part of the canonical Old Testament. Some stories may have come from later readers of the Old Testament who would see gaps in the text or feel uncomfortable with something in a story so they would create additional stories or alter stories about Old Testament figures. Although these pseudepigrapha texts were eventually deemed non-canonical, their non-canonical status was not always shared by ancient readers. Some of these pseudepigraphal texts were read and copied by many ancient Jewish and Christian congregations who probably accepted them as either part of their authoritative canon or at least as having some teachings worthy of their attention. Some of these texts became influential on early Christian writings, and some were even quoted in the New Testament. The actual grouping of these texts into a collection, particularly related to the Old Testament, was a later phenomenon, and in fact continues today as more texts are added to this corpus. 
The earliest of such collections that used the term pseudepigrapha as scholars do today was done in Latin by Johann Albert Fabricius at the beginning of the 18th century. His volumes were forerunners for later collections such as the first English volume in, in 1891 and the standard collection used today, James Charles Worth's The Old Testament Pseudepigrapha. The access to English translations of these manuscripts, most of which were originally written in Greek, Latin, and Eastern languages such as Slavonic, Ethiopic, Syriac, etc., has increased in time. Before the middle of the 19th century, very few of them were available in English, some in Latin, while many manuscripts were still untranslated in their original languages. Thus, there was not a collection of pseudepigrapha texts in English at the time of Joseph Smith, but some individual texts were available in English translations. Now let's talk about the Apocrypha. There's no question that Joseph Smith was familiar with the Apocrypha as he owned a Protestant Bible that included it. As part of his translation project of the Bible, Joseph Smith made marks throughout his Old and New Testaments for notes to revise particular passages, yet there were no such marks in the Apocrypha section of his Bible. When Joseph Smith completed the Old Testament portion of the JST, he had earlier completed the New Testament, he, his record stated that he came to that portion of ancient writings known as the Apocrypha, and he turned to the Lord for direction on how to proceed. On March 9, 1833, the Lord responded wh with what is now recorded in section 91 of the Doctrine and Covenants. Verily thus saith the Lord unto you concerning the Apocrypha, there are many things contained therein that are true, and it is mostly translated correctly. There are many things contained therein that are not true, which are inter interpolations by the hands of men. Verily I say unto you that it is not needful that the Apocrypha should be translated. Therefore, whoso readeth it, let him understand, for the Spirit manifesteth truth. And whoso is enlightened by the Spirit shall obtain benefit therefrom. And whoso receiveth not by the Spirit cannot be benefited. Therefore, it is not needful that it should be translated. We learn a few key principles from this section. First, the Apocrypha was not to be translated as part of the JST, and consequently, it is not part of the LDS canon. There are things in the Apocrypha that are true, but there are also many false interpolations of men. So whoever is going to read it should read it by the Spirit, for then benefit can come therefrom as the Spirit manifests truth. Not surprisingly, this becomes the church's stand on the value of the Apocrypha from this point forward, as seen in other instances where the Apocrypha was mentioned during Joseph Smith's lifetime. And perhaps the earliest outside reference to this new revelation of section 91, dated June 25th, 1833, the church leaders in Kirtland wrote a letter back to W.W. Phelps and others in Zion responding to some of their queries. Among their responses, they stated, respecting the Apocrypha, the Lord said to us that there were many things in it which were true, and there were many things in it which were, were not true. And to those who desired, it should be given by the spirit to know true from the false. At the ceiling of the Nauvoo Temple's unfinished capstone, another mention was made of the Apocrypha with the early saints. Not so much for the Apocrypha's content, but simply for its being part of the Bible. In Samuel Miles' later recollection of the event, he made the following claim. I was present when the books, writings, etc., were deposited in the southeast cornerstone of the Nauvoo Temple. Joseph was there overseeing the selection made for deposit. Perhaps 200 persons were collected around the place. When a Bible was presented for deposit, it was thought necessary that it should be complete, containing the Apocrypha. As there seemed to be none within reach, except large, highly prized family Bibles, Brother Reynolds Cahoon volunteered to go to his home, which was nearby, and cut out the Apocrypha from his large family Bible, which was accepted and the Bible thus made complete. In this case, it seems Joseph Smith placed enough respect on the Apocrypha to include it in the complete Bible that was going to be deposited in the cornerstone of the Nauvoo Temple. For an example where the content of the Apocrypha played a more active role, we can turn to early church periodicals where Joseph Smith's role is not always clear, but presumably he at least gave approval for most of the published articles. One of the earliest instances of quoting from the Apocrypha in church literature comes from the Evening and the Morning Star in 1832. In a brief article giving commentary on Hosea chapter three, it quotes from 2 Maccabees. In introducing this passage, which was to give important information on sacred objects like the Urim and Thummim, the article identified 2 Maccabees as that which the wisdom of man has seen fit to call Apocrypha. It then quoted verses one through eight, which described the prophet Jeremiah's exhortations to those about to be deported to Babylon, 
And Jeremiah is taking sacred objects from the temple and sealing them up in a cave dwelling on Mount Nebo. Jeremiah declared that the place would remain unknown until the time God gathers his people together again and discloses these things. This passage was thus quoted in the church periodical to show that some of these sacred objects were kept safe by the Lord, but that they would come forth again when the final gathering occurred, which was now underway. A later piece referring to the Apocrypha was published twice in 1841, including in Times and Seasons. It focused on some of the prophecies from the book of Esdras in the Apocrypha. The first part of the article set forth the value of Esdras' writings, since of all the ancient prophets, he was one of the most accurate and distinct in pointing out future events. It addresses the concern of whether his writings were inspired since they were written in Greek rather than Hebrew like other prophets. But the author felt that this was the same figure as Ezra of the Old Testament, so his writings were worth reading. It then goes on to share a few of the passages from Ezra's that have parallels in LDS theology. These passages included prophecies related to the second coming, like the resurrection and the exaltation of the just, and the return of the lost 10 tribes to receive their rewards. It also quoted the efforts of Ezra's to restore lost Old Testament texts that were destroyed or hidden due to the conflict of his day. The article ends with the invitation to read the book of Ezra's and then judge its merits. The book of Ezra's shows up in another episode of church history and became so influential that it led to a break off group who eventually moved their community to New Mexico. California had been their original goal. A member of the church named James Brewster read about additional books produced by Ezra's in 2nd Ezra's chapter 14. Yet these texts were later lost to history. Brewster, however, claimed revel revelatory gifts to restore some of these lost texts. In the end, Brewster published three books that he claimed Ezra's had meant to be guides for the people in the last days. The first, published in 1842 when Brewster was about 15 years old, was called The Words of Righteousness to All Men. According to a journal entry by Joseph Smith on the last day of 1842, Joseph Smith received a visit by John Darby, who wanted to follow Brewster's planned migration to California. In the course of their conversation, Joseph Smith stated that James Brewster's father, Zephaniah, had approached him earlier to share his son's new revelatory product with him. Joseph Smith said he saw the manuscripts and inquired of the Lord, and quote, the Lord told me the book was not true. It was not of him if God ever called me or spoke by my mouth or gave me a revelation. He never gave revelations to that Brewster boy or any of the Brewster race. <laughs> End of quote. A notice was also published in Times and Seasons about Brewster and some members of the church who chose to follow him. Quote, we have lately seen a pamphlet written and published by James C. Brewster purporting to be one of the lost books of Esdras and to be written by the gift and power of God. We consider it a perfect humbug and should not have noticed it had it not been assiduously circulated in several branches of the church." End of quote. The notice goes on to say that some members had been suspended for their involvement with Brewster and would have been cut off had they not promised to desist from their ridiculous and pernicious ways. Brewster's success was short-lived despite gaining some initial followers and in organizing the Church of Christ in 1848 centered on the Bible, the Book of Mormon, and the revelations of Esdras. After examining these cases of using the Apocrypha during the time of Joseph Smith, we search in vain for instances of Joseph Smith preaching directly from the Apocrypha. They don't seem to exist. In Joseph Smith's sermons and writings, he did not refer to specific stories, events, or figures from the Apocrypha. According to the early Christian father Irenaeus, one of the criteria for in, uh, including a text into the ancient Christian canon was whether it was being used by congregations, that is, quoted in sermons or copied and shared among congregations. This may be a reason the Apocrypha was not included in the LDS canon because it simply was not a major source for sermons or writings. Now let's turn to the Pseudepigrapha. And we'll probably only have time to talk about some texts related to Enoch. One figure who garnered, garnered a lot of attention in the pseudepigrapha is Enoch. From very early on, it was recognized that a passage in Jude, verse 9, came from the prophecies of Enoch. Joseph Smith made allusion to this fact as early as the end of 1830 when he stated, quote, much conjecture and conversation frequently occurred among the saints 
concerning the books mentioned and referred to in various places in the Old and New Testaments, which were now nowhere to be found. The common remark was, they are lost books. But it seems the apostolic church had some of these writings, as Jude mentions or quotes the prophecy of Enoch, the seventh from Adam, end of quote. Probably this information came from New Testament commentaries of the day, since it doesn't seem that Joseph Smith or other members of the church had actually read any of the pseudepigraphic works of Enoch until about a decade later. Joseph Smith proceeds to then quote some extracts from his prophecy of Enoch as found in the book of Moses, which incidentally does not contain the passage quoted in Jude. In an 1840 issue of Times and Seasons, brief mention was made in an advertisement reprinted from the New York Star about the forthcoming publication of the book of Jasher. As part of the excitement for lost books of the Bible, the advertisement also mentioned that recently the book of Enoch has been discovered, translated from the Ethiopic and published in England. In the next month's issue of the Millennial Star, published in England, a description of this apocryphal book of Enoch was given. Quote, we have now in our possession a book, the title page of which reads as follows, the book of Enoch, the prophet, an apocryphal production, supposed for ages to have been lost, but discovered at the close of the last century in Abyssinia, or Ethiopia, now first translated from an Ethiopic manuscript in the Bodleian, Bodleian Library by Richard Lawrence, Archbishop of Cashel, late professor of Hebrew in the University of Oxford. This book carries with it indisputable evidence of being an ancient production. It steers clear of modern sectarianism and savors much of the doctrine of the ancients, especially in regard to the things of the latter days. Notwithstanding it was translated and published in England, and that too by an English bishop who stands entirely unconnected with the Church of Latter-day Saints, yet it seems plainly to predict the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the mission of our elders, which they are now performing among the nations, together with the late persecution which has befallen our people in America, with the conduct of the rulers of that republic in refusing to give us redress. Yes, in fact, it predicts the final result of that matter and the complete triumph of the saints. We give the following extract, commencing at page 156, without further comment, and leave our readers to form their own judgment in regard to this remarkable book. The article then proceeds to quote from the book of First Enoch. In today's numbering of First Enoch, the quoted passages cover verses from chapter 103 and then chapters 104 and 105. It is not hard to see how an LDS reader could see parallels between the struggles against persecution recounted in First Enoch and the experiences of the early Latter-day Saints. What was more analogous was the lack of government action to stop the persecution and, in fact, the government's participation in it. There are also a few passages that foretold the coming forth of books that would bring the reader great joy. A newer translation even uses the word scripture for these future texts. Again, it would not take an LDS reader long to draw parallels with additional books of scripture, like the Book of Mormon, brought forth in the last days that would bring their readers great joy. Thus, a description of this section of First Enoch was included in the Millennial Star so that readers could judge for themselves whether this ancient text foresaw the events unfolding in the latter days after the Restoration. Similarly, in quoting from the article in the Millennial Star, a book published in 1841 on evidences that prove the validity of the Book of Mormon gave further interpretation of Enoch's prophecies. It claimed that the recent discovery of the Book of Enoch, quote, contains an evident prophecy of the coming forth of the Book of Mormon and the mission of the elders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, which they are now performing among the nations of the earth, together with the late persecution which has befallen this church in Missouri. It also speaks of the conduct of the rulers of this nation in refusing to hear and regard their cries for redress and protection and predicts the final result of that matter and the complete triumph of the saints, end of quote. Then goes on to quote the same introduction and passage from First Enoch as the Millennial Star. Concluding its quotation of First Enoch, it claims that whoever will take the pains to read the history of the persecution of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in the state of Missouri will find that Enoch in describing their complaints has given a most accurate description of what there happened unto them, together with the conduct of the princes or rulers of this nation in, refu in refusing to grant them redress for the wrongs they there suffered. And then the last section of addresses Enoch's prophecy of books of joy over which the righteous will rejoice. And they comment in this fashion. He says books in the plural because there, more than one book was to be given. The Book of Mormon itself is a book of books, 
and it contains 14 books of joy, of integrity, and of great wisdom, and many righteous have from these acquired the knowledge of every upright path, which is a quote from First Enoch, end of quote. The book concludes that, quote, the truth of the Book of Mormon is established, proved, and confirmed by this prophecy of Enoch, the seventh from Adam. So what can we learn from all of this? When looking at a few references to the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha in the writings of Joseph Smith and his contemporaries, we see great interest in only a few of these texts and very little acquaintance with the vast majority of the corpus as constituted today. There was certainly an interest by early saints for lost books mentioned in the Old Testament, and some equated the Pseudepigrapha text with these lost books. Yet the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha text did not form the basis for Joseph Smith's additional scriptural accounts of biblical figures, especially since the most compelling parallels between the Pearl of Great Price and extra biblical literature is with manuscript published after the time of Joseph Smith, or at least after the time of his writing of the text. When looking at the reading and interpretation of the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha by Joseph Smith and his contemporaries, it is similar to the ancient Pesherim among the Dead Sea Scrolls. Pesherim, which literally means interpretation, were primarily written in the first century BC and included quotations from Old Testament passages, but these passages were interpreted for their writer's own time and age, which they saw as the end of days. The Dead Sea Scroll writers thought the Old Testament prophets' primary audience was actually theirs, rather than, or perhaps in addition, to the prophet's own time period. This application of scripture to one's own day is certainly what comes out strongest when reading how the early saints read and quoted from the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha. They saw the message of many of these texts as directed to the last days and thus to themselves. These texts depicted an eschatological period of severe persecution, and certainly this is what the saints were experiencing at its worst in Missouri without any protection or redress from the government. These texts also foresaw a time for bringing forth additional scripture reserved for the last days, sometimes out of lost books from the past, but certainly heralding in a new era of joyful preaching of new messages. The early saints believed they were seeing the fulfillment of prophecies found in these ancient texts and were living through the eschatological experiences recording, recorded in them. Thus, the Apocrypha and Pseudepigrapha were not really the source material for Joseph Smith's additional accounts of biblical figures, but the early saints eagerly explored them to find messages for their day and corroboration for the latter-day events unfolding around them. Thank you. All right, it's good to be here this afternoon, and exciting to see the, the ex, good to see all the excitement this conference has generated. Um, I'm going to read part of my paper, and I'm going to have to summarize part of it because it's far too long for me to include everything that I'd, I'd like to cover uh, here. But hopefully, I'll get at least across to you some of the main points uh, that I want to make uh, here. So I'll, I'll begin by reading and then summarize a little bit later on. With the publication of the Book of Mormon in the spring of 1830, and Joseph Smith's claims to divine revelation that brought forth new and often unique teachings foreign to traditional interpretations of the Bible or established Christianity, there have been numerous attempts to uncover the sources behind such material. Since many have thought from the outset that more nat naturalistic explanations must surely account for them, all kinds of sources at one time or another have been marshaled to account for one peculiarity or another in Joseph's works and thought. In fact, one might say that a kind of general source criticism has almost emerged in the field that is sought to bring to light or in the hostile treatments expose the putative sources Joseph, Joseph drew upon. More recently, several writers have suggested that one source that may have influenced Joseph, especially with respect to his extra biblical writings like the JST, Book of Moses, Book of Abraham, and even the Book of Mormon, is the first century Jewish historian and apologist Flavius Josephus. While the suggestion has been made on a number of different occasions, it has never been rigorously pursued or investigated. To this end, the present paper seeks to thoroughly consider the potential influence the writings of Josephus could have had on Joseph Smith, and whether or not they may have left any discernible influence on the later's writings or thought. As a necessary preamble, a few words need to be said about Josephus and the scope and nature of the present analysis. Josephus, known by his trionomena, Titus Flavius Josephus, 
was born in AD 37 and died sometime circa AD 100 in Rome. A Jewish priest descended from the Hasmonean dynasty, Josephus is best remembered for his four surviving works that proved enormously popular among Christians for the next 1900 years. The Jewish War, The Jewish Antiquities, The Life, and Against Appion. His first two works, Jewish War and Jewish Antiquities, have proved to be the most influential, since in them he recounts Jewish history of his own time, as well as in previous ages, and includes a number of stories and sources hitherto unknown. In particular, in his Jewish Antiquities, which contains 20 books, he determines to recount the history of the Jewish people from the beginning up to the present, i.e. the end of the first century. And in the first 11 books, basically retells the biblical narrative contained in the Old Testament from Genesis through Ezra and Nehemiah. Josephus promises at the outset of this text that in his retelling of the biblical narr narrative, he would not so much as depart from any detail in the slightest, and that he would with fidelity and accuracy retell the whole biblical story. No sooner does Josephus begin the work then he immediately begins to depart from the biblical narrative in a number of ways. At times he adds numerous details not found in the Bible, and other times changes the story so drastically from the biblical account that they are hardly recognizable. Furthermore, he will even add entire stories which have no biblical precedent at all, or at other times excise passages as though they never belonged in the biblical account. This initial description of Josephus' handling of the biblical text and his Jewish antiquities ought to call to mind some of Joseph Smith's biblical revisions were either added, omitted, or otherwise altered select passages. The biblical territory most ripe for comparison between Josephus's and Josephus's alterations comprises the book of Genesis, and to a lesser extent, Exodus through Deuteronomy. The reason Genesis offers especially fertile ground is because while Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible uh, spanned the entire Old Testament, uh, his JST um, emendations are most pronounced in Genesis. Where, um, and additionally, we also have uh, the, uh, added to this, uh, the Book of Moses and the Book of Abraham. After Genesis, one may note that as a whole, the JST alterations are less numerous and less pronounced. While the JST of Isaiah and Psalms represents an exception, Josephus includes very little information from either book in the Jewish antiquities, since he's most concerned with retelling biblical narrative. Though the name Josephus may seem foreign to many people today, even to persons well-churched, between the 16th and early 20th century in England, Europe, and colonial and early Republic America, the works of Josephus were second in popularity only to the Bible itself. If Puritans arriving in New England brought with him any book beside the Bible, it was Josephus. And in fact, among the Puritans, it was the only book aside from the Bible that was permitted to be read on the Lord's Day. Interestingly, it was the second book of Jewish authorship, after the Bible, of course, to be published in colonial America in 1722 and it was, was among the initial 40 volumes contributed by the clergyman who founded the Collegiate School of Connecticut in 1701, now Yale University. For most persons at the time, their engagement with Josephus was not via the original Greek text or Latin translation, but were entirely dependent on the English translation of the day. The first English translation of Josephus to appear was in 1602 by Thomas Lodge. Enormously popular in the 17th century, this translation underwent multiple re-editions, with a new edition being printed about every decade. In 1692, another English translation was produced by Sir uh, Robert Lestrange. And by the end of the following century, between 1773 and 1775, it had begun to circulate in America as it was published in New York and Philadelphia. However, by far the most popular and enduring English edition of Josephus was printed in 19, er, 19, 1737 and was translated by William Whiston. Whiston, a professor of mathematics at Cambridge and successor of Newton, was also a gifted linguist who had a keen interest in theology and church history. In December of 1734, at the ripe old age of 67, Whiston began translating Josephus, and remarkably by January the following year had completed the entire project, meaning 1736. Published under the title The Genuine Works of Flavius Josephus, the Jewish Historian, Whiston's translation immediately won widespread acceptance as the quote-unquote received text of Josephus. Since the translation boasted on the title page, that it had been translated from the original Greek instead of Latin or French, and Whiston guaranteed in the preface that Josephus' testimony of Jesus was authentic. As a result, Whiston's translation was thought by many to be tantamount to sacred scripture and a natural companion to the King James Version of the Bible, as there have been no less than 217 reprintings of Whiston's translation of Josephus since 1737, a rate of about one every 1.25 years one can readily see the enduring popularity of this translation. Given the popularity of Whiston's edition, it is no surprise that by the later part of the 18th century, 
This was the most common English translation of Josephus in circulation in America. For example, the personal copy of Josephus owned by Hiram Smith was the 1830 imprint of wisdom. As one begins to zero in directly on Joseph Smith and possible points of contact with Josephus, it becomes evident that contextually speaking, Joseph could have had direct access to the writings of Josephus very early on. It may be noted here that in the Manchester Rental Library, formerly established between 1815 and 1817, and located within five miles of the Smith family farm in Palmyra, possessed a copy of Whiston's six-volume 1806 edition of Josephus. Furthermore, from newspaper advertisements from Palmyra during the 1820s and 1830s, it is evident that copies of Josephus were periodically advertised for sale in the local bookshops. Jumping ahead to the foundation of the church's first library in Nauvoo, established in the early 1840s, a catalog of sorts exists for the books that were donated by different church members. While Joseph Smith's personal donations did not include the works of Josephus, a number of members did donate personal copies of Josephus. And depending on how the titles in the catalog are interpreted, the works of Josephus may have been the most popular book in the library. Turning to early Mormon literature, Josephus is first invoked primarily in the church's newspapers, and in the earliest references is typically employed to help buttress claims unique to early Mormonism. Uh, what you have here, for example, uh, in the Evening and Morning Star, uh, Josephus is cited because apparently uh, he reports that Jews kept important records on metal plates. And so this is why this uh, comes up in the Evening and Morning Star in December 1832. Or in the Elder's Journal in November of 1837, Josephus is cited because he describes what the Urim and Thummim looked like. And so a comparison is then made there with what uh, jo uh, Joseph Smith describes uh, the Urim and Thummim. What's interesting, though, and I was only able to find this out with the aid of Google Books, is in fact, while it may appear that the saints are paying a lot of attention to Josephus, in fact, they're coming to jo Josephus via secondary material. In fact, as I began searching, it became very clear they're not reading Josephus, but reading a Bible dictionary about Josephus, or a history about Josephus, or a history of the Jews that mentions Josephus, and they're actually quoting this material uh, more often than not. Turning now to Joseph Smith, I have found three direct references showing that he was acquainted with the works of Josephus. The first, which will be treated in more detail later in the paper, comes from the journal of George Laub in an entry dated April 13, 1843. On this day, Laub commented in a long sermon given by Joseph that touched on different aspects of Genesis, he made a reference to Josephus when discussing the giants that appeared in the days of Noah. The next reference comes from the later in the year in a letter addressed to James Arlington Bennett dated November 13, 1843, and published in November 1843 edition of the Times and Seasons. In this letter, wherein Joseph, Joseph tried to impress Bennett with his language skills and knowledge of various ancient authors, which you know now was written by W.W. W. Phelps, he makes a passing reference to Josephus among other ancient writers. The third and final reference comes from uh, Joseph's time in Carthage jail in June of 1844. According to an account given by Willard Richards and preserved in the history of the church, on the fateful day of June 27th, 1844, Hiram Smith read extracts of Josephus to Joseph, John Taylor, and Willard Richards. While the references are few, they do show that at least by the 1840s, Joseph was somewhat directly acquainted with the works of Josephus. Now here I'm going to have to summarize because I have uh, about 35 pages of comparison. Let's give you a, a small uh, sampling of this. But let me begin with the very first verse of the Bible. This is very interesting uh, here. So what I've included at the top is the uh, Septuagint version, the Greek version of you know, the uh, uh, first verse of the Bible. So in the beginning, God er, you know, uh, created heaven and earth. And why I have in red there is this word epoesen, which just means made. When you go down to Josephus' retelling of this, he actually changes that verb, and that's very significant. In fact, he changes to the word katizdo, which actually doesn't mean made, but it actually means, and I've given my own translation here of this, it actually means fashioned. God didn't make the earth, he fashioned the earth. What's interesting is when Josephus goes on, when he talks about fashioning Adam and Eve out of the dust of the earth, in fact, in Josephus, it's Adam and Zoe, not Adam and Eve, um, he actually does this, uh, uses this very same verb. What's interesting here, uh, of course, that you know, when you go to the book of Abraham, it talks about, well, God didn't you know, create the earth, he organized the earth, he fashions it. And so, in fact, you find a parallel here between uh, what Josephus is saying and Joseph Smith is saying, Again, you'll find this, of course, elaborated more by Joseph in the King Follett Discourse. What's interesting, though, is this, is that in every single English translation of Josephus, including Whiston's, they miss this nuance. In fact, what Whiston does, and what everyone who preceded him, will harmonize this to the Bible. 
In fact, it's not going to be until 1920 edition by Henry Thackeray that he'll actually note saying, Josephus is not actually saying creatio ex nihilo, he's saying creatio ex aliquo, or creation from something. And so this is interesting here that clearly wouldn't have been derived up from the English. So it's an interesting parallel that I thought that I uh, should mention, although clearly it would have been, wouldn't, could not have been derived from uh, the English of Josephus. Now let me just say a few things um, about uh, early chapters of Genesis. And here I will just, uh, be fairly uh, cursory uh, in this. Um, what I think ought to be stressed here is that, in fact, when one begins to compare the treatments of the Bible, uh, Josephus and Joseph Smith's, it becomes very clear they're marked far more by difference than by similarity. For any general parallel you might have, in fact, there's dozens and dozens of differences. So, for example, when you look at uh, how Joseph Smith reworks some of the early chapters of Genesis, uh, Satan plays a very prominent role. However, when you go to Josephus' narrative, he totally expunges Satan, even from the Garden of Eden. It's not actually mentioned, believe it or not. And so you can see here a, a difference here, and it goes with what they're uh, doing here with the text, which is kind of interesting. Uh, what goes on uh, also as you uh, move along? Uh, for example, uh, both Josephus and Joseph Smith say a lot of extra-biblical material about the curse of Cain. But they both do it in very different ways. There's no parallel to be drawn between them. Although I did find one uh, general parallel here between Josephus and Joseph Smith. When Cain's expelled, it says Cain's expelled, and he goes off and he takes a wife and he marries, uh, and he has children. Of course, the problem is, who's Cain actually marrying? Uh, you have to assume, take the biblical literally, he's marrying his mother. And what's interesting is Josephus will actually say, well, in fact, Adam and Eve had other children, and so he's marrying uh, another daughter. What's interesting, too, is that when you go to the... Uh, JST, it also says that, of course, Adam and Eve had other children, and Cain then goes and marries a, um, another daughter of Adam and Eve. I should point out, by the way, this Joseph is not the only one in antiquity to say this. In fact, most biblical commentators in antiquity are, str are stuck by the, struck by this and say they are clearly are children of Adam and Eve. But again, here is a, a parallel uh, of sorts between the two. Um, what's interesting is when you go to uh, Genesis 5, you get the ages of the patriarchs. And what I found interesting is that Josephus um, will often change the ages of the patriarchs from what you get in the biblical text. And in the JST, it will often change the age from the patriarchs um, in different uh, editions of the JST. What I found interesting is that there's never one place where Josephus and Joseph Smith agree against the biblical text. I mean, they have a unique uh, number that doesn't appear in the Bible. Whenever they agree, it's always in the Bible, and that seems to be uh, the mediating uh, text there. Now, moving into Genesis 6, and again, there's much, much more could, I could say here, but I'm trying to restrict myself to just a few points. Uh, this is an interesting point. Um, in Genesis 6, you have these sons of God who come down, and they consort with women, and then they have these children who are giants. Well, Jos Josephus expands and talks about how these sons of God are, in fact, angels that come down from heaven, they see uh, these women who are very attractive, they come down, assume bodies, and have offspring. So this is how he takes the biblical narrative here. Uh, what Joseph Smith does, in, the, in Moses uh, anyway, is he will actually take the word sons of God not to refer to angels, but uh, people who are in the covenant. They're clearly mortals uh, here. He wants to make his point. And in fact, he reconfigures, so it's the daughters of the righteous sons who forsook the covenant and married non-believing men. Why I, I think this is important here is because in George Laub's journal, he actually makes the statement that Joseph Smith commented on this in a discourse given April 13, 1843. And he said, this is what Joseph said. He says, now the history of Joseph in speaking of angels came down and took themselves wives of the daughters of men. See Genesis 6, 1 to 2. These were resurrected bodies. They violated the celestial laws. I find this very uh, confusing to some degree because if this is taken correctly, it seems that Joseph Smith um, mentions in Moses in one way, now changes his mind later on. Why I even doubt this further is what Laub's account. I think he mentions Josephus. I think Laub somehow has missed a nuance here because three days later, Willard Richards uh, remarks how Joseph will give a sermon on resurrection and made it very clear it only happened after Christ. So in other words, you have to assume that Joseph had one opinion on this passage, uh, changed his mind on April 13th, then changed yet again three days later. And so I'm inclined to think here that Laub, well, he, Joseph Smith mentioned Josephus. The way that Laub constructs this in his journal uh, seems to be... Um, Something strange is going on here in light of what we have in Moses and also in uh, Willard Richards. Let me uh, say a couple words about Abraham. And I'll return here and I'll read from my paper here. Well, Josephus and Joseph Smith will both, en both enhance the presentation of Abraham or Abraham with extra biblical additions. They tend to differ far more than they agree. Following a terse biblical account, Josephus introduces the figure of Abraham in the context of relating Shem's posterity. 
and as soon as he is introduced, he is leaving with certain family members for the land of Canaan. On the other hand, when the book of Abraham introduces uh, Abraham or Abram, it contains a lengthy extra biblical account for which there is no parallel in Josephus of how Abraham was miraculously saved from the Lord by being sacrificed to idols. Whereas the Bible gives no reason why Abraham left Ur of Chaldea, Josephus adds he left because he was driven out by his kinsfolk. Well, in the book of Abraham, Abraham left because God directly commanded him to do so. When Abraham leaves Canaan for Egypt, Josephus follows the biblical narrative and relates that Abraham instructed his wife to tell the Egyptians that she was his sister and not his wife, lest they seek to kill him because of her beauty. In the book of Abraham, however, it is the Lord who warns Abraham about the Egyptians and instructs him to tell his wife that she is his sister, lest he be killed. During Abraham's sojourn in Egypt, the episode that has garnered the most attention with respect to parallels between Joseph Smith and Josephus has to do with Abraham instructing Pharaoh regarding the principles of astronomy. In the biblical account, there is no mention that Abraham ever instructed Pharaoh in astronomy, or Pharaoh's court. But Josephus relates that during his sojourn in Egypt, Abraham impressed the Egyptians with his knowledge of mathematics as well as astronomy. The book of Abraham also reports that Abraham knew astronomy. And while there is certainly a distinct parallel here between Josephus and Joseph Smith, it also needs to be pointed out there are some key differences in the way they present Abraham teaching astronomy. First off, whereas the book of Abraham relates that the principles of astronomy were given to Abraham in a nighttime revelation before he entered Egypt, Josephus reports that Abraham had already acquired such knowledge while still in Chaldea, and that he had acquired uh, this uh, through celestial observation, because he was a natural prodigy and a wise man. Second, Josephus frames Abraham's presentation of astro astronomical insights within the context of mathematics, whereas in the book of Abraham it never reports that Abraham taught mathematics but taught the Egyptians astronomy, or this is implied anyway, uh, in um, uh, facts only three, that teach the realities of monotheism. Finally, in Josephus' account, Pharaoh is never mentioned, and the context presupposed that Abraham taught generally the Egyptians arithmetic and astronomy, whereas the book of Abraham, again, facts simile three, implies that Abraham taught Pharaoh specifically astronomy. In this respect, this later a point here, the book of Abraham account is actually closer, this is what I found very interesting, to an account given by Artapanus, an ancient Jewish author who lived in Egypt sometime before the first century BC, since he specifically reported that Abraham taught Pharaoh astronomy in his court. In fact, Artapanus is only preserved in a later Christian historian Eusebius, and in a work by Eusebius called Preparatio Evangelica, and this work will not be translated in English, it will first occur in uh, 1903. I should point out also that there will be other Jewish authors, Philo of Alexandria, will also comment on Abraham knowing astronomy. And in fact, Philo will actually talk uh, not in this context, but in terms of how light circulates in the, through kind of in the universe, has some interesting parallels here between Abraham 3, 5 to 8, 12 to 13. But again, the first time Philo is translated into English is Young's translation of 1854. Let me say a couple words about Moses and then uh, the Book of Mormon. Again, I could talk about Melchizedek or Joseph in Egypt, but let me just say a couple words here. Um, Moses is a very important figure for Josephus. He is the lawgiver, and so he presents him in a very particular way. He will often excise any story that makes Moses look bad, but he also then he emphasizes aspects that make Moses look really well. So he depicts Moses more or less as a wise general. In fact, he tells a story that Moses apparently, as an Egyptian general, led forces down into Egypt. This, of course, is not in the Bible. When you go to Joseph Smith's treatment of Moses, especially the extra-biblical treatment of this, there's no mention of him being a general, but it really focuses on him uh, being a prophet, receiving revelation, which is very two different presentations of Moses. Now, there's a number of differences, but I did find two kind of uh, general similarities uh, between the two. Um, when, when Josephus treats uh, Moses leading the Israelites out of Egypt, or these ten plagues, uh, Josephus makes it clear that, in fact, it's not the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart, but Pharaoh was just a stubborn person and kept doing this. For Josephus, he found this posed a problem to divine theodicy. Interestingly enough, when you go to the JST, the same thing occurs. It's not the Lord hardening Pharaoh's heart, but in fact, he does this of his own accord. The second thing, uh, which is interesting, is that Josephus reports at the end of Moses' life, and he says, although it may say in the Bible he dies, in fact, he was taken up to God. A cloud overtook him, and he returned to the Lord. Interesting, again, when you look in Deuteronomy, um, you know, well, the Lord buried him, but in fact, the JST, the Lord took Moses unto the fathers, and again, this is then expanded in Alma 45, 19. But again, I should point out that, in fact, Joseph is not the only person antiquity to say this. You will find this in some extra-biblical treatises, for example. We don't have it, but the assumption of Moses will also mention this. 
Let me uh, say something here about the Book of Mormon just for a moment, going beyond the Bible. If I were to look at perhaps some very general thematic similarities, and this would then go to Josephus' Jewish War. As he narrates this war against the Romans, what will ultimately lead to the decline and the destruction of the temple in AD 70, he talks about what are the conditions that led to this decline. And there's various factors, Roman mismanagement, um, Jewish sensibilities, but one of the things he really blames in this whole narrative is in fact, he says, well, these groups of robbers became very prominent. As society declined, robbers began emerging in the countryside, sacking uh, villages, towns, roads, and communication broke down. So robbers are blamed for destruction of the society. When you go to the Book of Mormon, again, you might find a general parallel in terms of the Gadianton robbers being blamed to some degree for the destruction here of society. Now let me get to this picture that some of you are looking at and see pointing. Um, uh, the most, at least in the Middle Ages, the most quoted story um, of Josephus by Christians is not his, the, the, his mention of Jesus or his mention of John the Baptist or his mention of James the brothers of Jesus, but it's this story here that in the final weeks of the siege of Jerusalem, things got so bad that in fact um, a woman there resorted to cannibalism within the city. In fact, she saw that it was only a matter of time before the Romans would breach the walls. People were starving, and so she didn't want her, a child, to be taken and sold in slavery. And being in desperation, she then took her son, killed him, and ate him. And Josephus uses this as a point to say, this is when we know God had truly forsaken the Jewish people. He's gone. It's over. It's interestingly enough, and this is a different context, but when you go to the Book of Mormon, uh, what's the one place in the Book of Mormon that you see that God now has truly forsaken these people? Well, for me, it's in Moroni 9, uh, Mormon's letter to his son Moroni, when he reports that, in fact, they had turned to cannibalism. In fact, people had been taking uh, Lamanite women hostages, uh, sexually assaulting them, and then eating them as a sign of bravery. He says, it's over. It's too late. The civilization is gone. Now, it is very different context here. I want to point this out. But again, there is a thematic similarity. Although what I ought to point out here, too, is in fact you do find this in Leviticus and Deuteronomy and even Jeremiah. They're actually warned about this. You will know that God's forsaken you when you start eating people. It's a great sound that we see this here in Josephus. So it's interesting you see this in, in the, the book of, of uh, in the, uh, yeah, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and Jeremiah. Let me just uh, end really quickly and summarize a couple things. What's interesting is, again, um, this passage here with Miriam and uh, here the reference to Jesus stoning of James, this does not occur anywhere in early LDS literature. In fact, this famous passage here, this reference to Jesus, what becomes known as the Testimonium Flavianum, the first LDS writer that actually references this is Orson Pratt in the Journal of Discourses on September 28, 1873. It's uh, interesting. And, and what is different here is, in fact, most Christians who are talking about Jesus at this time spend a lot of time talking about this passage or the passage referring to James or the passage referring to John the Baptist. Um, also, I should mention uh, here, um, when I uh, looked, at, did this comparison, I also did a very close kind of textual analysis. And what was nice here, I was able to search like, digital versions of Josephus, as well as, uh, well, the standard you know, works, you know, the JST, Book of Moses, Book of Abraham. And I was never able to find a single uh, word for word parallel between the two. Um, and so, what would I say then? Uh, how does uh, Joseph Smith, how well does he know Josephus? Well, the impression I get is he's certainly aware of him. I, I'm not convinced at all for a moment that he's a real scholar of Josephus. He knows many details. And based on what I saw earlier on is when Josephus is mentioned in early uh, writings of Latter-day Saints newspapers, they're often, they're often encountering Josephus via a Bible dictionary, a commentary, something like that. This is what I'd be inclined to think, is that perhaps if Joseph Smith does know more about Josephus, it's probably via this as to, opposed to him actually sitting down and reading it. And so I uh, could say more, but I think I'm out of time, so I, I will end there. But thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, let me make sure I'm the right distance here for the microphone. I'm a little bit vertically challenged and don't usually reach the microphone. Um, my goal to today is to kind of offer a theoretical framework for uh, uh, usage of the Apocrypha in studying Joseph Smith, and uh, I find it kind of, in a general sense, a wild and woolly area. So I'm going to read some of my, most of my paper because I, I, I take a few shots and so I want to be careful in the way I do those. Um, 
Several approaches to interpreting Joseph Smith's use of the so-called Jewish and Christian apocryphal literature have been employed both by the critics of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints and by those scholars professing faith in the church and whose interests may be <coughs> classified as apologetic. These approaches span the range of probative of Joseph Smith's restoration of lost texts in scripture and dismissive of Mormonism generally because its sacred religious texts are founded on flagrant plagiarism of apocryphal literature. Before one can answer the most important historical question at hand, how Joseph Smith used the Apocrypha and what relationship that body of literature had to early Mormon writings, it seems prudent to first of all establish some controls on the discussion. This is necessary because previous, previous discussions have largely contented themselves with drawing out parallels between apocryphal writings and early, morning, early Mormon publications without any discussions of whether or not Joseph Smith had access to those texts under discussion. And I appreciate uh, the care that's been shown today. Moreover, a wide variety of modern translations of ancient apocryphal texts are often employed when there is no possible way that someone living in the early 19th century could have known them. This is particularly important when citing phrases or passages that Joseph Smith might have incorporated into the language of the Revelations. An additional concern is that the context in which these events took place has had little bearing on the discussion, when in fact it is a significant issue. At issue is the way that Joseph and his contemporaries handled and approached extra-biblical texts. It is necessary to ascertain their willingness to use extra-biblical literature in the establishment of doctrine, in the shaping of their theological teachings, and whether or not extra-biblical lit literature had any normative value for faith and faith communities. From an examination of the available literature on the subject, it would appear that the presence of phrases, themes, concepts, teachings, and phraseology from the Apocrypha in Joseph Smith's writings have been viewed as extraordinary by both LDS scholars and those wishing to undermine the claims of Mormonism. For LDS scholars, the presence of parallels to intertestamental and Christian apocrypha in early Mormon writings has been indicative that Joseph restored ancient doctrine and practice. For non-LDS scholars, the presence of parallels has been used to draw attention to the possibility that Joseph plagiarized available sources. Unfortunately, neither solution is probable. The larger reality is that the presence of such parallels may arise out of a much more mundane event. His family, or perhaps Joseph, was accustomed to reading a Bible in which the Apocrypha were included, and that the language of the Apocrypha is later echoed in Joseph's early writings. Moreover, this paper will demonstrate that like many of his contemporaries, Joseph Smith was interested in Apocryphal literature and its implications regarding the Christian biblical canon. I would also note that he, he seems to appreciate its potential to hold hidden truths. Joseph Smith's and his family were not atypical Bible readers for New Englanders of their day. However, despite their interest in and family gatherings devoted to reading of the Bible, Lucy Mack Smith would later claim apologetically, quote, that Joseph had never read the Bible through in his life. At least some people close to Joseph saw him less a student of the Bible and more of a cultural Bible reader, but one who was given to meditation and study. Perhaps the most significant piece of evidence regarding Joseph Smith's knowledge of the Bible comes from his report of the visit of the angel Moroni, who quoted Malachi in a vision. Joseph was able to note differences between the printed KJV edition of Malachi and the way Mormon Moroni quoted the same passage. Some of these early reminiscences have obvious apologetic and explanatory interests, and one can readily appreciate the fact that Lucy Max Smith's statement is partially interested in expelling the myth that her son Joseph was a careful student of the Bible during the time period of the translation of the Book of Mormon. Despite this apologetic interest, her summary is consistent with other accounts that Joseph was ponderous, but perhaps not engaged in long periods of focused reading. Joseph's account of the visit of Moroni, however, can be interpreted to mean that he was very conversant with biblical language. Even this conclusion, however, must be tempered because Joseph may have left out important details in the account, such as the fact that it required study in order to discover the differences. In addition to these statements, Joseph Smith and Joseph Smith Sr. in an interview once claimed that his son Joseph Jr. was, quote, illiterate, unquote, intending to convey the meaning that Joseph had not no formal academic training. 
That Joseph Smith Jr. was illiterate has direct bearing on the question of whether he might have used the Apocrypha in shaping his Book of Mormon narrative. It speaks to his approach of using the Bible or biblical text, how he used books as academic sources, and what academic resources he might have used. Overall, the picture of Joseph studying texts, reading books, and using those sources to shape his narrative seems unlikely. The case is strengthened when an additional piece of evidence is brought to the discussion. When translating the Book of Mormon, Joseph frequently and extensively cited from the Old Testament and from language of the New Testament, and the New Testament language permeates the Book of Mormon. Rather than attempting to conceal, however, the Old Testament quotations in the Book of Mormon, Joseph quoted them in nearly verbatim language to the printed KJV at his disposal and at the same time attributed them to their proper source when he knew it. 2 Nephi 11.2 confirms this. The process of translation of the Book of Mormon, as we've heard earlier, is described in a number of first-hand accounts, none of which mention the use of books that were consulted or other materials that were used in the translation process apart from the plates that Joseph kept mostly covered. We can be confident that Joseph did not look things up in secondary sources, read through books, or consult notes as he carried out the actual translation process. Specifically, Emma Smith claimed that Joseph did not use manuscripts, probably meaning that he did not use loose sheets of paper or during the writing process. She said, quote, he had neither book nor manuscript that he read from. If he had anything the, of the kind, he could not have concealed it from me. Others who were involved in the translation also affirmed that no books were used or open during the translating process. However, it is possible that in the months between receiving the plates in September 1827 and February of 1828, Joseph may have studied and pondered the plates without actually translating the characters, and we've heard a paper on that today. During this time, it appears that he spent some time attempting to translate, but without any notable success. And again, we've heard some great information. This quote appeared earlier in Dick Bennett's presentation. He normalized the uh, spelling. I've given it here yeah, as it appears. Joseph noted, quote, in the December following 1827, we moved to Susquehanna. The Lord had shown him, Martin Harris, that he must go to New York City with some of the characters. So we proceeded to copy some of them. And he took his journey to the eastern cities and to the learned saying, read this, I pray thee. And he returned to me and gave to me to translate. And I said, I cannot, for I, have not, for I am not learned. But the Lord had prepared spectacles for to read the book before I commenced translating the characters. One way to understand this passage is to interpret it to mean that Joseph intended to say that he had not been able to translate the characters from the plates prior to the visit to Anthon, Mitchell, and others, an event which took place in the fall of 1828, or sorry, in, uh, yes, um, Yes, set 27, an event that is described here as visiting the learned in New York City. Important for this study is not whether Joseph had time to carry out research that may have included, among other things, reading the Bible and the Apocrypha prior to his beginning of the translation of the Book of Mormon. Although no sources indicate that Joseph was devoted to study during the months prior to the beginning of his translation, it is possible that some of his time was spent reading. It may be that he read the Apocrypha during this time, and I would emphasize maybe. This window of opportunity is important for this study because, it because there are several words and phrases from the Apocrypha that appear in the Book of Mormon and nowhere else. The most significant piece of evidence in this regard is the appearance of the name Nephi in the Book of Mormon and 2 Maccabees 1.36. So it becomes what scholars call a hapex legomena, or a word that is uniquely used Kind of in, in these two, in these sources. Because the name appears nowhere else in biblical literature and only in 2 Maccabees in the Book of Mormon, one can confidently surmise that Joseph had heard the name um, in 2 Maccabees. The unique name, Nephi, is alone sufficient evidence to suggest some type of literary borrowing. The vehicle, at this moment, I'm not going to mention how it, it happens. Additionally, some editions of the Apocrypha printed in the years 1820 to 1830 printed the name as Nephthi rather than Nephi. However, the 1828 Finney Bible that Joseph Smith owned does print the name as Nephi in 2 Maccabees 136. And I can say that I've examined all three of the Bibles that Joseph had in his possession, and they all spell it Nephi. Uh, 
There are a number of other striking parallels as well, but again, they're in a big picture, um, not formative of the Book of Mormon language. The most striking of those, appear in the part from the appearance of the name Nephi, is the occurrence of the name Isaiah, which is again a unique reading between 1st Esdras 8, 2 and Helaman 8, 20. Other examples of shared language that's fairly significant is, quote, for he was filled with wine, comes from Judith. Uh, he took hold of the hair of his head, Judith again, and also in Book of Mormon that appears as took by the hair of his head and to make an, Egypt, uh, an abridgment. And you'll see that comes from 2nd Maccabees again. These parallels bear, bear strong overlap in language, but none of them arguably alters or informs the structure of the Book of Mormon. If parallels were formative for the structure of the Book of Mormon narrative, or if the parallels followed an identifiable linear development, then one could argue that Joseph Smith indeed borrowed the Apocrypha to build the Book of Mormon, and notice that they're almost all um, in 1 Nephi. Instead, these parables show that the language of Apocrypha crept up into Joseph Smith's wording and phraseology. To a much larger extent, the language of the Bible also informed Joseph Smith's Book of Mormon language. This is unsurprising given Joseph Smith's lack of formal education, and it is reasonable, but that the, it is reasonable that the parallels that exist should be explained in the light of the fact that Joseph was most likely unaware of their source. Skipping forward, um, by 1841, the Saints had moved from New York City to, Nau to New York, to Ohio, to Missouri, and to Nauvoo, and had begun to openly embrace a traditional model of education. During a meeting of the Nauvoo Lyceum in 1841, John C. Bennett, a man of, of fame, was being introduced into the Lyceum, to the Lyceum audience. In that setting, Joseph Smith offered a physical description of John C. Bennett a man who had recently been baptized into the faith and who had just arrived in Nauvoo, where he described Bennett in terms that are very reminiscent of a passage from the Acts of Paul. LDS scholars have long recognized the potential parallel and have commented upon the possibility that Joseph may have been aware of the description of Paul found in the Acts of Paul 1.1 and the public description given of Bennett. The public description of Bennett is recorded as follows, although Joseph attributes it to be a description of Paul. Quote, he is about five foot high, very dark hair, dark complexion, dark skin, large Roman nose, sharp face, small black eyes, penetrating as eternity, round shoulders, a whining voice, except when elevated, and then it almost resembles the roaring of a lion. That uh, has long been thought to describe the Apostle Paul in another publication that I, I worked on previously, um, I argue that that fits jo John C. Bennett's um, uh, physical description to a T. In fact, there are no deviations uh, between what John C. Bennett looked like and what's said right there. In fact, during his excommunication proceedings from a Masonic lodge, it says, quote, John C. Bennett had a large Roman nose. So we, we really do have good confirmation that that's what Bennett looked like. Um, Fortunately, the genetic relationship between the Acts of Paul and Joseph Smith's description of Bennett is clear and direct. We can state with certainty that Joseph Smith owned a copy of William Hone's influential, the Apocryphal New Testament, where he would have had access to the Acts of Paul and its description. Specifically, he owned a copy of Hone's edition of the Apocrypha from the 1832 Ravenna, Ohio printing, and he lo later donated said copy to the Nau Nauvoo Library. The Acts of Paul descriptions show several marked parallels to Joseph's description of John C. Bennett, but rather than quote the Acts of Paul directly, it once again appears that an ancient source shaped and molded Joseph's language, perhaps without Joseph even being aware of the source of the parallel. When compared side by side, the, that they suggest, the parallels suggest that Joseph was drawing upon memory to aid him in the description and that the parallel was not overt or perhaps even intentional. Joseph Smith was attempting to flatter Bennett, the former quartermaster general of the state of New Illinois, and he drew upon uh, language from the Apocrypha. Further use of William Holmes, and I'll, I'll make quick work of this part, but we can confirm uh, the uh, usage of William Holmes Apocryphal New Testament in several editorials by the saints. In 1842, in Times and Season, W.W. Phelps mentions the Infancy Gospel of James, which is only in English, uh, available in English through the Apocryphal New Testament. 
There he mistakenly connects the murder of Zacharias, son of Barachias, mentioned in Matthew 23, 35, with the father of John the Baptist, who is also named Zacharias. The saying of Jesus, as recorded in the, Math- in the Gospel of Matthew, uh, as you remember, says Abel and the martyrs Abel and Zacharias, and only the Proto-Evangelium of James and early Mormon writings associate that with the father of John the Baptist. And so we, we can connect them fairly conclusively there. Also in 1842, in the evening in Morning Star, um, as was mentioned in Jared Ludlow's paper, that second Maccabees is quoted with the intent to confirm biblical accuracy. In doing so, the editorial states, quote, and I give this here, uh, which is recorded in the second chapter of second Maccabees, which the wisdom of man has seen fit to call Apocrypha. The statement is hardly a ringing endorsement of Apocrypha as a source of history, but at the same time, the reference also demonstrates rather uncritical usage of the Apocrypha, and as as Jared mentioned, uh, the further context there. In January 1833, the Morning Star again mentions the Apocrypha with additions to the Book of Esther in the Apocrypha, wherein it states, quote, ancient men of the world put this down as doubt, put down as doubtful. Both editorials suggest that the saints were putting into practice a principle that would be revealed in March of 1833 as Doctrine and Covenants, section 91. Um, I'm going to move to the book of Jasher here, which causes a lot of excitement for the saints and uh, try to ascertain Joseph's feelings through some of the things that are said by others. To help document whether or not Joseph Smith's perceptions and opinions toward the Apocrypha, it is important to consider Joseph's and others' reactions to the English publication of the Book of Jasher, a book that has always been considered apocryphal, both in content and origin. In June 1, 1840, the Times and Seasons ran an announcement publicizing an English printing of the apocryphal Book of Jasher that it would eventually appear in print in August 1840. Like other 19th century Americans, the saints were quite excited by the publication of what was supposedly the lost book of Jasher. Key to the excitement surrounding the publication of Jasher is that it is mentioned twice in the Old Testament, 2 Samuel 1 and Joshua 10. In the hype leading up to the publication, a rather rather public exchange in England between a publisher and scholar included claims of discovery and antiquity for the forthcoming edition of the book of Jasher. Interestingly, the debate was founded upon a relatively recent forgery of the book of Jasher by Jacob Elive, who printed a forged account for monetary gain and recognition. In 1828, a translation of the book of Jasher based on the Moses Samuel edition of a medieval text of Jasher was published in England. That publication, in part, helped end efforts by the English printer to republish the forgery. Despite the questionable basis of the Samuel translation, however, um, its publication was well received. So essentially, Samuel um, beats another publisher to the press and thus uh, um, inhibits this forgery from going to print. It appears that a letter written by Joseph Smith and Sidney Rigdon and Frederick G. Williams to the Saints in Missouri on June 25, 1833, an attempt was made to address some of the public concerns regarding the debate in England that early on. Their letter reads, quote, in part, we have not found the book of Jasher nor any of the other lost books mentioned in the Bible as yet, nor will we obtain them at present. Respecting the Apocrypha, the Lord said to us that there were many things in it which were true, and there were many things in it which were not true, and those who desire it should be given by the Spirit to know the true from the false. And you can clearly see the language of Doctrine and Covenants 91 here in this revelation or in this letter. Because the letter corresponds roughly to the time of Samuel's translation appearing in print, and seven years prior to the American publication of the book of uh, Samuel Mordecai in 1840 suggests that the saints were interested in the discussion taking place in England and were hopeful that it would be a genuine edition of the Book of Jasher. The letter takes a skeptical tone, but ironically the copyright of the English edition criticized in the letter was later sold to an American printer and would eventually make its way to the saints. John Taylor and not Joseph Smith appears to have offered the most enthusiastic endorsement of the Mordecai Book of Jasher. In a Times and Seasons editorial entitled The Book of Jasher from June, 18, June 1, 1840, John Taylor offered the following words of praise for the Mordecai edition. It is full of interest 
and written with a warmth of piety and sacred devotion worthy of taking an equal rank with any of the mus missing books, not strictly canonical. Of course, Taylor had not read the book yet, but his pre-press excitement is obvious. Additionally, Taylor stated that it amplifies the events recorded in scripture, although in a later um, editorial entitled Persecution of the Prophets, he did notice a discrepancy between Jasher and the Book of Abraham. I will note that Taylor does later go on to quote the Book of Jasher in General Conference in 1872. I want to make some concluding remarks and, and move to where I'm headed. Um, we've already mentioned um, the instance of Joseph Smith placing the amended Bible into the, uh, during the dedication of the Nauvoo Temple. And I want to mention another such source that comes from much later, um, expressed in Joseph commenting upon a family Bible. In visiting Edward Stevenson in Pontiac, Michigan in 1834, Joseph was gather visiting a small gathering of the saints. According to Stevenson's journal, the prophet looked over our large Bible and remarked that much of the apocrypha was true, but it required the Spirit of God to select the truth out of those writings. He also looked over a large English book of martyrs, and I'm sorry I have this quote here for you. He also looked over a large English book of martyrs and expressed sympathy for them and later reports, and later reported that he had asked through the Urim and Thummim regarding the lars lives of the martyrs mentioned in the book. My conclusions. The surviving evidence favors the idea and, and conclusion that Joseph Smith was influenced in direct ways from the Apocrypha. As a reader of the Bible, Joseph would have encountered the Apocrypha during personal or family reading of the Bible. Those early experiences are now rather difficult to trace, but the presence of several names in the Book of Mormon that have parallels only in the Apocrypha suggests that Joseph Smith had probably read those texts. Because those same apocryphal writings do not bear any direct influence on the narrative structure of the Book of Mormon, it is unlikely that the parallels between them are anything more than memories that surfaced in Joseph's thoughts during the translation process. He may not have been aware that the parallels between the books of the Apocrypha and the Book of Mormon existed. Reports of the translation confirm that no outside books were used or consulted. The process of translation relied upon Joseph and his abilities, and his training and early literary experiences almost certainly included moments where he read the, uh, the Apocrypha. A similar occurrence is demonstrated in Joseph Smith's description of John C. Bennett, where there are par evident parallels to the Acts of Paul, a Christian apocryphal source that was not part of the Bible, but a book that came into Joseph's possessions in the 18 possession in the 1830s. Again, the connection between the Acts of Paul and the description of Bennett seems to be memory. Joseph appears to have remembered structure and general outline, but he did not remember precise phrases or exact content. Later Latter-day Saint writers show a, rem a marked interest in the Apocrypha because they found it probative of Joseph Smith's teachings and revelations. They found proof texts for the doctrines of early Mormonism, and as a result, they began to trust the history of those sources and other matters as well. That growing relationship of trust in the Apocrypha as a source of history is also evident in several statements attributed to Joseph Smith, and it is a safe conclusion that Joseph Smith exhibited an open a trust in the Apocrypha as genuine history in some instances. Thank you.
the only American professor of ecclesiastical history active during the lifetime of Joseph Smith was Samuel Miller, here pictured, who taught the subject at Princeton Seminary from 1813 to 1849. Miller was actually professor of ecclesiastical history and church government, and although he claimed to keep the two subjects of his professorship separate, his teachings of church history strongly focused on polity. In other words, his primary aim was to show that the Presbyterian form of gov church government was in place at Christianity's inception. Miller then, like Joseph Smith, believed in the same organization that existed in the primitive church. The difference between the two was that Miller turned to the patristic sources to defend this particular form of church government, while well, Joseph Smith never did. Miller was certainly not enamored of patristics in general. Nevertheless, he thought that, that budding pre Presbyterian ministers should know the opinion and practice of our fathers in all past ages. Mostly, however, such knowledge was intended to serve apologetic rather than pastoral purposes, since in the 19th century the fathers were deployed by Protestant professors to batter down claims regarding doctrine and polity made by competing Christian groups to help claim their denomination's governance as faithful to that of the apostolic era and to prove how soon in Christian history a decline had set in that led precipitously towards Roman Catholicism. Only the last of these approaches applies to early Mormon discourse, as far as I've been able to tell. Moreover, with the exception of the doctrine of baptism for the dead, early Latter-day Saint authors were not quick to enlist the fathers as allies or opponents in contemporary denominational battles over religious belief and practice in the cultural wars of the day. The cultural wars of the day were, however, primarily fought over rights of association with the primitive church. As such, the battleground lay in the correct interpretation of the Bible, with the preferred weapons of being theological science, as Robert Baird tells us in his 1844 survey of religion in the United States of America. Baird observes that the increased attention which the theologians of America are giving to the accurate and learned investigation of the Holy Scriptures may be regarded as an indication of the tendency of theological science in this country. Such a view was founded on the premise, quote, that the scriptures are the only authority in matters of faith, a premise that Baird states was not only universally acknowledged in theory, but more and more practically acted upon. This quest for right interpretation was considered to be both science and art. The best theologian, states Baird, must be he who, understa is, must be he who understands best and can best explain the Bible. Moreover, this interpretation was attached, detached from the historical development of Christian doctrine. The question, what did Edwards hold? What did the reformers hold? What did Augustine, Jerome, or the earliest fathers hold, though admitted to be important in their place, says Baird, are regarded as of small importance in comparison with the question, what saith the scriptures? What did Christ and the apostles teach? Miller and Joseph Smith thus worked within a theological context in which the tendency of theological science, as well as a popular exposition of Christianity from the pulpit, was towards the primitive simplicity of Christian truth. Such a view necessarily prejudices against the fathers. As Elizabeth Clark points out in her study of the development of the field of early church history, upon which this portion of my paper is based, in Protestant America, appropriating the church fathers was always a negotiation with what interpreters believed were the authentic words of Jesus who could be cordoned off from subsequent Christian history. How then were the fathers appropriated in the early 19th century? The easiest answer is with difficulty. Elizabeth Clark, for example, in commenting on the academic infrastructure that attended the, seach, the teaching of church history in early and mid 19th century America, observed that suitable textbooks seemed non existent, let alone of anthologies of primary sources in translation, and libraries were conceived as book depositories for shockingly small collections and were only open for a few hours a week. From the composition of Miller's personal library, it is not unreasonable to conclude that many of the patristic writings that Miller cited in his polemics against Episcopalians and others were derived not from first-hand knowledge of the primary sources, but from secondary accounts. There is a certain irony in this fact, since when, for example, Samuel Miller wished to impress upon his students the decline that soon affected the church, he exhorted them, read Cyprian, 
read Origen, read Eusebius. But there is no suggestion that these authors were required reading for the class, nor for that matter that the students had access to these texts. In fact, it was not until the publication of the American edition of the Anti-Nicene Fathers in 1885, beginning 1885, and the Nicene and Post-Nicene Fathers beginning in 1886, a project initiated by Philip Schaff, really the father of, of uh, patristic study in 19th century America, that students had ready access to the fathers in translation at all. Even then, the focus was on the earliest period of patristic writing, that period most likely to aid a correct interpretation of the New Testament. The profile of early Mormon encounters with the fathers fits within the contemporary trends. So, for example, it is not at all surprising that there is no evidence in early morning periodicals, early Mormon periodicals, that the contributors had read any single patristic text in its entirety. Rather, all quotations from patristic sources or references to events and figures of the early church are taken from general church histories or encyclopedia articles. Moreover, even the articles reprinted from the newspapers and books of the day are, de are themselves derived from general works rather than from the reading of patristic texts. We can draw two conclusions from a general survey of patristic citations in early Mormon periodicals, and there aren't a great number of them. Firstly, Latter-day Saints of this period were reading several different general histories of Christianity and using what was relevant in their own publications. Secondly, readers of early Mormon periodicals were introduced or referred to many key figures and ideas from early Christianity in these periodicals, suggesting either a certain level of general literacy regarding early Christianity or that patristic authors and early church events were evoked more for their cultural or apologetic potency than for any inherent value that they were deemed to have by the authors who mentioned them. I'm now going to look at three specific examples, three themes that we find coming out of the use of patristic and early church uh, materials in early Mormon periodicals. In turning from general considerations to specific examples, we will look at three themes treated in early Mormon periodicals that resort to the early church fathers in interesting ways. Two of the earliest articles that mention the fathers are on the theme of persecution. The articles appear in the June 1832 issue of the Evening and Morning Star and the August 1835 issue of the Messenger and Advocate, and both are extracted from other sources. Importantly, however, both are framed by deliberate prefatory remarks that provide the hermeneutical lens through which the pieces should be read. We could even go so far as to say that the reproduced articles serve as the rhetorical flagpole upon which the introductory comments are raised. The theological setting of the 18, June 1832 article is charged with a, with a certain apocalyptic fervor, which can not only be seen by the publication of Doctrine and Covenants 45, 1-17 in this issue, and 3rd Nephi 30 earlier in the same issue, but also from other editorial remarks, such as that which prefaced news regarding a cholera epidemic then raging in the Middle East, which reads, it is no, with no order, ordinary feeling that we select an item or two in relation to the cholera morbus. Its ravages for the past year on the Eastern continent have been great, so that if ever the pestilence walked in darkness or destruction wa wasted at noonday, now is the time. But the Lord, the Lord has declared that it should be so before he comes in glory and we have only to rely upon him for deliverance when he sweeps the earth with the besom of destruction. The editor is W. W. Phelps, as we may have guessed from the wonderful language, and the same sort of heightened rhetoric introduces a subsequent article on persecution in the early Christian church. This article is reprinted from a contemporary newspaper, but ultimately derives from James Wheatley's 1751 volume entitled The Lives, Trials, and Sufferings of the Holy Apostles, Primitive Fathers and Martyrs, who have from time to time suffered for the faith and the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And within that text, lines have been interpolated from Fox's Book of the Martyrs. In the course of recounting the sufferings and martyrdoms endured by the early Christians under the reign of Nero, the author refers specifically to Eusebius as a source for the narrative and to a quotation by Tertullian regarding the persecution. The point is not to evoke empathy for the early Christian saints so much as to, as to as a sense of kinship. As Phelps remarks, the following article has lately appeared in the newspapers of the day, and we copy it to show that the religion of Jesus Christ has always been persecuted. But when a saint lives to God, persecution or applause is all one. The soul is above them. <laughs> 
Three years later, Oliver Cowdery, in his role as editor of The Messenger and Advocate, published another article on the theme of persecution, which reproduces the entire chapter six of Fox's History of the Martyrs. We know that copies of Fox's Book of the Martyrs have been circulating among the saints at least from 1834, and that one such copy came into the hands of Joseph Smith. Oliver Cowdery did not engage with the text in the tradition of learned ministry, as did John Wesley, for example, who produced an abridgment of the Acts of, uh, the, of the Acts and Monuments. Rather, Oliver was concerned to emphasize the inevitability, again, of persecution following the saints. Few men in our day, Cowdery observes, know of the extreme persecution the ancient saints endured for the sake of the gospel of Jesus Christ. This statement would be less true if Cowdery were talking about the saints of the New Testament church. As his readers would well know, Paul, who, as Cowdery goes on to say, Paul, who also suffered death for the testimony which he bore, has given us to understand that those who live godly in Christ Jesus suffer, great, suffer persecution. And the author of the epistle to the Hebrews has mentioned the fact that those who lived before him were under the necessity of excluding themselves from society and wander in dens and caves of the earth. However, Cowdery reproduces a chapter from Fox that describes 4th century and not 1st century persecutions. Cowdery thus, perhaps inadvertently, sets up a tension between a belief in the decline, the rapid decline of earliest Christianity, and a recognition motivated by this experience of martyrdom of the sincere sincerity of the faith of the persecuted Christians of later centuries. However, the choice of the Galerian persecutions, 303 to 311, may have been further validated by a belief that the, authentic, that the authenticity and priesthood authority of early Christianity had been retained at least until the Council of Nicaea. Perhaps this could, as I think can be uh, understood from a statement made in an article published a year earlier in the evening of Morning Star. The purpose of including this extract, however, was not to make a theological point, nor simply to inform the states about, saints about the faithful who were persecuted in the early fourth century, but rather to give Cowdery's readers an idea of the unanimity of the enemies of the truth and the eagerness to deprive the saints of their privileges and rights. The tendency to generate sympathy for and recognize the faith of the early church was vastly outweighed by a desire to demonstrate the decline, deviation, degradation, or apostasy of early Christianity. This was a common motif among Protestant and especially Restorationist movements. However, the theme of the declension and apostasy of the early church took on a personal aspect for the Latter-day Saints in the Kirtland Crisis of 1837. Certainly, Warren Cowdery aimed to make this point in the July 1837 issue of The Messenger and Advocate by reprinting a long extract from Joseph Milner's Church History, which recounts episodes from the first Christian century. He was concerned in this section to show the propensity, of, this is his words, the propensity of mankind to deviate from the course which the God of heaven has pointed out for his servants to pursue, thus reiterating the traditional narrative of decline. However, the extract was intended to have a more specific and immediate message, which was to demonstrate that, quote, even in the first century, while those eminent men were yet living who received their instructions from the great head of the church and held communion with the unseen world through the medium of that spirit which was promised them to lead them into truth, the great proneness in mankind to apostatize or substitute something for religion or something of its ordinances which the God of heaven never accepted. The text is a warning, repeating the warning of Paul, Paul that grievous wolves shall enter in among you not sparing the flock. Cowdery concludes the introduction by simply affirming that the history of the church subsequent to that period fully verifies that prediction. We therefore recommend the candid perusal of this extract and hope our readers may profit by the instruction contained in it. In this extract then, Readers are invited to encounter a polyvalent text, seeing evidence of both ancient decline and its possible repetition during the restoration due to the great proneness of man to apostatize, even when living, living among those eminent men, even when living among those eminent men who received their instruction from the great head of the church. Belief in vicarious baptism Guy Bishop notes, was not a part of mid-19th century American religions. This may be true in practice, 
However, the subject, at least as raised by 1 Corinthians 15.29, was a controversial issue in the exegetical literature of the day. Thus, the early 19th century English New Testament scholar Samuel Thomas Bloomfield wrote, quote, if we were to judge, and you can see this partly on the screen, if we were to judge the difficulty of this passage from the variety of interpretations, we should say that it is the most obscure passage in the New Testament. The learning and labor expended on ascertaining the sense has been immense, and the matter contained in the various dissertations would form a good-sized volume. Bloomfield himself rejected the attempts to construe the passage figuratively or metaphorically, as other commentators had, since such interpretations were deemed to be simply philologically insupportable, and instead he concluded that, quote, there can be no doubt that the expression is to be taken in the natural sense. And it seems that he initially was convinced by the interpretation of the ancient fathers, Tertullian, Epiphanius, and Ambrose, who he cites, as well as many eminent modern expositors who consider that the verse is in fact making a matter-of-fact allusion to the practice of vicarious baptism, i.e. of baptizing a living person in the place of and for the benefit of one who has died unbaptized. However, before Bloomfield can settle into this exegetical solution, he is caught in his own tracks by concerns that, quote, no certain proof has been adduced that the practice of vicarious baptism was prevalent so early as the time when the passage was written. They knew it happened later in the, ch at the early church. And at last, Bloomfield's own prejudices decide the day. Quote, nor is it to be believed that the apostle would, for the sake of so precarious an argument, for the practice was doubtless very rare and secret, countenance so groveling a superstition involving a profanation of baptism. Thus, for Bloomfield, the argument turns on the simple implausibility of vicarious baptism being an authentic early Christian practice with the concomitant implausibility of Paul referencing an errant practice simply in order to make a point about the, res about the resurrection. Bloomfield's analysis, his Greek Testament from which this comes, was first published in Boston, New York, and Philadelphia in 1837, provides part of the intellectual and exegetical context within which we should place Joseph Smith's early remarks about baptism for the dead, such as the statement in his letter to the Travelling High Council dated 19th of June 1840, that baptism for the dead was, quote, certainly practiced by the ancient churches. Here, Joseph's new doctrine is positioned as the only correct exegesis of Paul's problematic saying about an early Christian practice. Thus, even though Joseph Smith says, that he gained his knowledge, quote, independent of the Bible. The religious potency of the doctrine of baptism for the dead is magnified by Joseph's insistence that he has reached, without the aid of theological science, the correct interpretation of scripture. Thus, although the fathers, and indeed Paul, are in no way presented as being catalytic in the development of this doctrine, they are readily mustered as confirming witnesses to Joseph Smith's re restoration doctrines. It was almost two years after the doctrine of baptism for the dead was first preached and began to be practiced that a Mormon publication included a confirming quotation from the fathers. When they did, the quotation was used to confirm two things simultaneously. First, that baptism for the dead was known to be practiced in the early church. And secondly, that this practice had inevitably devolved into a degenerate state. This is the passage. Chrysostom says that the Marcionites practiced baptism for the dead. This is what... Says, uh, as it goes on, after a catechumen, this is what Chrysostom says, after a catechumen was dead, they had a living man under the bed of the deceased. Then, coming to the dead man, they asked him whether he would receive baptism. And he, making no answer, the other answered for him and said that he would be baptized in his set, stead. And so they baptized the living for the dead. It's a, uh, yeah. The, the, first, um, the, the passage first appeared in an editorial in the, on the doctrine of the baptism for the dead, published in the Times and Seasons in, for April the 15th, 1842. The editorial is simply signed the editor, and since Joseph Smith is listed as the editor for this issue, it's not unreasonable to assume that he's the author of this piece. However, uh, it seems that both John Taylor and Wolf of Woodruff were involved in the Times and Seasons at this period. So it's reasonable to conclude that this editorial on baptism for the dead was at least a joint production by John Taylor and Joseph Smith. The Chrysostom quotation is drawn from an article on baptism for the dead in Buck's well-known theological dictionary, 
which was published in Philadelphia in 1830, and which is now known to have been the source for the first paragraph of the Lectures on Faith, and therefore in active use among Latter-day Saints from at least 1835. Interestingly, Benjamin Winchester, another uh, Latter-day Saint um, writer of, of sort of dubious standing, is also reading Buck and giving his, this same quotation in his Synopsis of the Holy Scriptures, also published in 1842. This gives us an extremely interesting opportunity to observe the subtle but significant differences in the handling of this quotation in these two different publications and by these two different editors. Buck warns the reader in his, uh, in his dictionary that vicarious baptism was, quote, practiced among the Marcionites with a great deal of ridiculous ceremony. Of course, such remarks participate in a generally held belief that the extravagant rituals of Catholicism are a sure sign of the decline from the simplicity of primitive Christianity. Nonetheless, Winchester includes this phrase when he cites this passage. And he also extends his quotation from Buck to include some of the reservations expressed by Buck about the dating of the practice of vicarious baptism for the dead back to Paul, even citing a commentator who interprets the verse quite differently. What is more, whereas the Times and Seasons editorial simply appropriates this quotation without attribution, Winchester cites his sources. Winchester's caution is thrown to the wind by the more confident author of the editorial for the Times and Seasons, the allusion to this being a ridiculous ceremony is removed. More importantly, the quotation from the Ties and Seasons is framed by a statement that guides the reader to the immediately apprehend its significance. Quote, the church, of course, at this time was degenerate, and the particular form might be incorrect. But the thing is sufficiently plain in the scriptures. Hence, Paul, in speaking of the doctrine, says, and go on to, goes on to quote this verse. Thus, no doubt is raised about the straight line that can be drawn even through the mists of degeneration between Paul's statement and the passage from Chrysostom. In other words, these are linked together uh, strongly as, further, as evidence of, of Joseph Smith's restoration practice. Conclusions. Joseph Smith's relationship to the ancient world is charged by the claim that Mormonism is not a new religion. B.H. Roberts is emphatic about this point. Mormonism, I repeat, is not a new religion. It's the old religion, the everlasting gospel restored again to the earth through the revelations received by Joseph Smith. Of course, Mormonism was not the only Christian sect to claim continuity with the primitive church. However, although the usage of patristic citations for apologetic purposes fits within the broad contemporary trends, there's no evidence that the fathers were ever turned to as a source for new knowledge. Unlike their contemporaries, quote, as a critical component of their restoration project, Joseph Smith and his followers were not content to rely on the Bible alone, close quote. The key to Mormonism's vitality, therefore, was Joseph's willingness and ability to generate new knowledge independent of the Bible. Thus, if we were to rightly interpret the evidence of context between Joseph Smith and his followers and the early fathers, we must acknowledge that the contexts were principally driven by an impulse to identify validating material among the ancient religious texts and cultural remains that they came in contact with. There is no holy eclecticism here. The Christian fathers were not put in service in the quest for truth. Rather, they are seen as barely, barely plausible witnesses to a truth that has seeped away from the once pristine primitive church. Therefore, the fathers were relevant to the restoration project only as reluctant witnesses, not as conduits of lost truth. Thank you. I'd like to thank the presenters for their thoughtful and informative papers. Rather than spending too much time on the particular strengths and weaknesses of these presentations, their arguments, I think, are mostly clear and compelling. I'd like to pay the highest compliment by commenting on the thoughts, ideas, and, in and issues they invoke. This conference in general, and this panel in particular, ask, whether explicitly or implicitly, questions of intellectual validity, vindication, or dependence. Did Joseph Smith restore ideas present in the ancient world, yet absent in his contemporary culture? This panel, was he dependent on other texts for his own ideas, revelations, and scriptures? This panel is specifically interested in Joseph Smith's relationship to the ancient sources, the Apocrypha, Josephus, and the Patristics. Do these sources vindicate or condemn the prophet?
as Thomas Wayman's paper aptly says, quote, for LDS scholars, the presence of parallels to ancient texts and early Mormon writings has been indicative that Joseph Smith restored ancient doctrines and practices, while for critics, on the other hand, quote, the presence and parallels has often been used to draw attention to the possibility that Joseph pl plagiarized available sources. Tellingly, the papers in this panel largely sidestep such a dualistic and simplistic framework. While they touch on issues of dependency, awareness, and vitality, they uncover another layer of inquiry by exploring the type of work Joseph Smith performed with these sources. Jared Ludlow, for instance, demonstrates how early church writings show an interest in apocryphal texts and an affinity to the eschatological prophecies found therein with the saint's current situation. Besides Smith's famous encounter with those texts while translating the Bible, a revelatory intersection that resulted in DNC 91, Ludlow shows that early Mormons were off to quote from, reference, and vindicate their own ideas through these books found on the periphery of the scriptural canon. Whether it was using Jasher in, the, in church periodicals, or Joseph Smith insisting that the Apocrypha be included in the Nauvoo Temple's cornerstone, or a splinter group basing their authority on an exegesis of the Book of Esdras, saints were not only aware of, but also engaged with these hybrid texts. As we move away from an emphasis on the quantitative intersections of ideas, who knew what and when, toward a qualitative analysis of these intersections, what does it tell us about Mormonism's culture? Two important points and questions can be drawn from Ludlow's excellent analysis. First, it leads us to ask the question of whether Mormons were more common to draw from the Apocrypha than other American churches. Was there something in Mormonism's open canon that made them unusually receptive to ideas of extra canonical books? This issue seems to point to a broader dynamic in Mormon history. On the one hand, same seem, saints seem eager to find new revelatory texts. Indeed, their church's prophetic claims seem to mandate such. But on the other hand, Joseph Smith and church leaders were left to find some type of canonical restraint that curtailed scriptural power and maintained a coherent revelatory corpus. The threats of the schismatic group posed by drawing on the authority of the book of Ezra is an example. And as David Holland has demonstrated in his book, Sacred Borders, this was a larger cultural dynamic at play in American culture in general, thus making Mormonism an important case study in establishing theological and scriptural boundaries while still maintaining some form of cultural elasticity. Second, Ludlow's paper skillfully shows the Mormon's in imaginative reading of apocryphal sources, setting a blueprint for mapping Mormon interpretive readings in general. Yes, Mormons read the Apocrypha, but they read it in distinct ways. In most cases, it was read to validate their unique Mormon views and vindicate their millenarian expectations. Phil Barlow labeled this process selective literalism, and Grant Underwood has shown that the larger millenarian framework saturated their hermeneutic world. This case study seems to validate these claims and can expand the analysis to better encompass the cultural work Mormon extra canonical scripture entail, reading entailed. Professor Wayman similarly addressed the Apocrypha, though from a subtly, subtly different angle. His approach emphasized the method behind the content and makes sophisticated observations while doing so. The previous dichotomy, dichotomous analysis of Joseph Smith as restorer of lost texts or Joseph Smith is willful plagiarizer is inadequate, he tells us, because it overlooks the simple fact that Joseph Smith's biblical culture engendered a language and memory that prompted, that promoted both overlap as well as distinction. I appreciate women's characterization of Joseph Smith as a cultural Bible reader who incorporated either consciously or subconsciously elements and phrases from the corpus of writings we know as the Apocrypha. From the names Nephi and Isaiah in the Book of Mormon to the description of St. Paul in Nauvoo, Smith drew from the cultural verbiage bequeathed from the books he read and the orality he heard. Such a porous relationship imbibed rhetorical and ideological crossover to a degree that evades simplistic categories. Though he doesn't use a term, Wayman is utilizing the powerful tools of a theoretical model known as communities of discourse. Practic practitioners of this term pay special attention to how a shared culture and shared discourse shape rhetorical space and 
that add specific meaning to particular words and phrases. This places the knowledge of cultural context at a premium, for it requires a historian to make sense of seemingly similar ideas. It also introduces a sophisticated theoretical framework that transcends the simplistic and bifurcated categories that have dominated Mormon intellectual history. This now brings up the tricky question of intellectual influence, a reoccurring theme in several of these panels. In my estimation, to claim either ideological dependence or independence uh, in the classic sense, where Joseph Smith is either depicted as completely indebted to or free from these other sources, is based on at least three critical mistaken assumptions, all of which are rooted in a distinctly positivist outlook. First is the idea of a cogent intellectual source from which to copy ideas in the first place. This assumes that there was a comprehensive, cohesive corpus of ideas passed down from the early church fathers or Josephus from the past, or Thomas Dick and Emanuel Swedenborg in the present. As the pa papers in this panel have shown, which is supported by other scholarship in the last uh, few decades, these ancient and modern ideas were as multifaceted as they were dynamic. To assume cohesion would be to endow an artificial systemization that is clearly not there. The second mistaken assumption is the concept of intellectual transmission, or the idea that these theologies and ideas can be passed on within a vacuum. As these papers especially demonstrate, though, concepts and ideas, even when originating from a single individual, become porous across an energetic print and religious culture. American religionists don't know Josephus's writings as much as they know Richard Watson's interpretations of Josephus's writings as found in his theological di dictionary. There was no such thing as an objective and honest reading of an ancient or contemporary source, only interpretive and imaginative misreadings that reveal more about the reader than they do of the original author. Such analysis fruitly draws from the rich field of reader response theory and captures the topic's complexity. The third caution in tracing an intellectual and reception history is to note that the resulting theology produced by those who are under question of being influenced are often as eclectic and dynamic as the original ideas and the transmission process. This is especially true of Joseph Smith, who is much more eclectic than syncretistic in his prophetic endeavors and didn't seem too concerned with the niceties of a systematic theology. Thus, the basic assumption of intellectual history, at least as seen in past generations of Mormon historiography, that implies a cohesive primary source, cohesive transmission, and cohesive theological result overlooks the messiness of religious history in general and early Mormon thought in particular. Which leads us to Lincoln Blumel's paper, which asks a series of provocative questions surrounding what has Josephus to do with Joseph. The first question, was Josephus' work popular in early America, is answered with a resounding yes, though with qualification. The translations and editions of Josephus' works were sporadic, incomplete, and uneven, and most Americans were exposed to Josephus through secondary sources. The second question, were Mormons aware of Josephus, is similarly nuanced. Yes, Josephus keeps popping up in LDS print history, but any more than superficial examination will reveal that they too were primarily dependent on what others said of Josephus rather than what Josephus said himself. The third question, and a question that previous generations sometimes obsess over, is was Joseph Smith dependent on Josephus? The answer, which I imagine we could all anticipate, is no, though there are some noteworthy similarities. Wumel demonstrates persuasively, in my opinion, that to claim intellectual plagiarism is the case in the case of Joseph and Josephus would be to gro a grossly simplistic and misdirected reading of two very complex and dynamic thinkers. And I mourn that you weren't able to see his extended analysis of their writings, which was really top notch. But importantly, Blumel doesn't stop there. Breaking down the artificial and superficial ba barriers of intellectual dependence and independence is merely the first step of responsible analysis. The fourth question of Blumel's paper is more subtle and implied than the others, but is perhaps the most important. Beyond determining influence, are there still lessons to be learned in comparing Josephus and Joseph Smith? I think the answer is clearly yes, as the paper demonstrates the power of a, com a comparative study, even of two figures separated by nearly two millennia. Both thinkers, Blumel writes in his conclusion, which he scrapped in this paper, so luckily I have it for you, 
have in common the idea that the biblical text is malleable and can be expanded, contracted, or even reshaped, though their motives for doing so were undoubtedly quite different. The mere fact that both felt the biblical text was seemingly inadequate and that they possessed authority, even audacity, to alter the text represents an important parallel." End quote, unquote. This point hits on one of the hallmarks of religious studies as a discipline. That analysis is always done best when done in comparison. Call it the Darwinian metaphor. Only in competition can uniqueness be determined or developed. And this leads us finally to Christian Hill's examination of patristic writings in early Mormon periodicals. Here we find a prime example of using Mormonism as a singular case study amongst a broader issue. Joseph Smith is placed alongside Samuel Miller, Robert Baird, and Samuel Bloomfield as examples of those who balance a primitivist worldview which maintained a declension narrative of early Christianity with a paradoxical obsession with early Christian writers. As Hill astutely notes, the yearning for primitive simplicity prejudiced Americans against the Christian followers, yet reference to the fathers remained plentiful. The, th the three theological uses that the patristic patristics served, persecution, apostasy, and rights for the dead, held a tenuous position within the Mormon and Christian corpus and bequeathed an ironic legacy of pragmatic adaption and creative reinterpretation. Though I disagree with Yale's conclusion that the church fathers were not put in service in the quest for truth, based on my interpretation of Joseph Smith's eclectic and rest restorative prophetic approach, I agree with his general idea that Mormons used patristics quite selectively and unevenly. The analysis found in this panel, the sophisticated interpretations of Joseph Smith's creative readings of ancient texts, can be further expanded by utilizing the tools of the cultural churn in today's academy. Uh, intellectual historian David Hall recently argued that the future of intellectual history depends on our ability to be hybrid creatures and incorporate the modalities of cultural history. Put simply, we must put to rest questions of intellectual genealogy and turn our attention to what those ideas tell us about the broader culture, whether elite or common. What does the type of work Smith is performing tell us about antebellum hermeneutics? Uh, other intellectual historian Quentin Skinner reminded us several decades ago not to mistake, mistakenly assume context to be the determinant for specific ideas, as what we are tracing is more the dialogic and porous culture than the ideological pedigree. And this is an especially fertile and needed approach in LDS scholarship. For the next generation of Mormon studies, those who wish to explore Mormonism's developing theology must first understand the intellectual air in which its early inheritance breathes. Recognizing the eclectic theological climate of varying degrees of adaptation and agreement, and then attempt to determine the significance of Mormonism's mesh of theological answers. And once these answers are better un understood, it is then t crucial to apply these answers to larger cultural questions and issues, emphasizing how Mormonism both embodied and diverged from their larger biblical environment. In an important way, I conclude, this panel and the conference in general serves as a useful barometer in tracing the development in Mormon studies as a discipline, especially studies of Joseph Smith's thought. I think it's safe to say that if a panel on Joseph Smith and ancient texts were held at BYU a decade ago, uh, the content would probably have been quite different. By moving past the limited and parochial questions of determining Joseph Smith's prophetic validity through appeals to his ignorance on the one hand of ancient sources, yet his triumph on the other hand of replicating these ancient truths, Mormon scholarship, especially scholarship on Joseph Smith, can move on to new questions of the type of work Joseph Smith was doing, not to mention the corpus of work he accomplished. Richard Bushman has recently stated that the aim of Mormon scholarship in past eras was to prove Mormonism true. Today, though, he notes that the aim is to find the truth of Mormonism. The implication being, as I understand it, that there is something about the rigorous study of Mormonism that claims power and potential to answer important historical, academic, cultural, and hermeneutic questions beyond the mere vindication of Joseph Smith's prophetic status. This, I think, is a worthy, challenging, and exciting goal, and I think this panel, in part, points us in the right direction. Thank you. Thank you.